it's good to stay alive, right? You don't want to die. So in the case of Colorado, you can fart and start a forest fire. So I roll over, you know, I look like a walrus trying to hump off a rock. And I'm not exactly a set of car keys. I'm pretty big dudes. Because that thing leaked like the Iraqi Navy. The flint and steel, if you're going to be um, Jeremiah Johnson and uh, start a fire with a flint and steel, I highly suggest you pra- practice said task in multiple environments, starting with your backyard and some gasoline, because that it ain't easy. I think you got to be around those things. First of all, they're so big. Yeah. yeah. Like when, it's a horse with a tree <laughs> grown out of its head, and it's screaming like yeah. like, a, like an animal from the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't yeah. even seem real. And, and- we strongly suggested that they call it the gritty film tour. They uh, opted for the full draw film tour, so everybody makes mistakes. Breakfast of champions, Snickers, <laughs> <laughs> and Diet Dr. Pepper. <laughs> Come on, get a piece of it. Why, yes, Brian, it is true. <laughs> Sounds terrible. The days of our lives. Hello, all right. You're listening to the Gritty Bowman, home of Gritty Bow Hunting films, interviews, tall tales, and a wee bit of manly boasting. I'm South Cox, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> hey, this is Corey Jacobson, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. We bone and raised outdoors, <laughs> and you've been listening to the Gritty Bowman. <laughs> there you go. I'm Casey. And I'm Jordan. And you're watching <laughs> The Gritty, Gritty Bowman. Bowman. <laughs> okay, friends. On this episode of Gritty Bowman, Mark Brownlee and myself hang out with our friend Greg Munther at the annual BHA Backcountry Hunters and Anglers Rendezvous. Greg is from the older generation. Like, he's 72 years old. But he doesn't seem that old. He's still getting out and killing bighorn sheep coos deer, mule deer, and elk with his stick bow, which he's been shooting his entire life. Greg tells us how he uses llamas to help him get things done in the backcountry. He's an inspiring person, and his passion for the outdoors and for hunting is infectious. In his younger years, Greg Munther was a forest service biologist, district ranger, and natural resource consultant. He has been roaming the hills, streams, and lakes of Montana continuously since 1976 with passions split between bow hunting, bird hunting, and fly fishing. He lives in Missoula with his wife, Sherry, of 35 years, and their German short hair pointer, Lucy, and their three llamas. Greg is the BHA Montana chapter chairman. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Greg Munther. Well, you know, I'm a, I'm a traditional bow hunter, uh, so I spend a lot of days in the woods for every animal that I harvest. Yep. It's just... It's, I do that on purpose because my objective is time in the woods, not necessarily what I bring home. <laughs> okay. And, and, that, and I just love getting close. I love to get so close I think they can hear my heartbeat thumping. And that, you know, for me, that is the epitome of hunting. Yes. It's being in wild country in places where the animals uh, are doing all their natural stuff, their natural environment. Yep. You don't feel pressured that somebody's coming over the hill after you. And llamas allow me to get into that back country and Absolutely. you know when you're there that you got it to yourself and you can spend as much time as you want. I watched one herd of elk. Does it make you want to have a llama, Mark? Yeah, yeah. It makes yeah. you want to have a llama. Very much it? so. Yep. Yeah. And and the uh, you know, I watched one herd of elk for four days and I never disturbed them for four days because there wasn't a great stocking opportunity. On the fourth day I saw an opportunity to move on these elk. And I moved in and killed a bull, you know, it bit, but it was like, so, you know, and, you, and so for folks that don't know, you know, uh, we're at the backcountry hunters and anglers, uh, rendezvous in Missoula, Montana, and I'm here with Greg Munther and you're not exactly a spring chicken. <laughs> I can see the finish line. <laughs> Let's put it that way. I can see the finish I'm, line. That's brilliant. I'm, I'm sprinting towards the finish line. Let's just say that. But you're still getting it done with a, a, a st- with traditional gear in the backcountry all the time. That's that, yeah. That's hunting. That's a that's a that's that's just inspiring. That's what keeps you going. It, it you know if once the day you turn on the TV and decide you want to watch hunting shows, <laughs> that's the time. It's over because it's a lot easier to watch shows and get out there and do it. But, yes. you know, I'm scared to death. 
that if I <laughs> slow down, it'll be over. Yeah. And I just love everything I do. It's because, I mean, I have the best of the best. Yeah. Why wouldn't you use it while you can? How old you know? are you now? 72. 72. Uh, when was the last uh, time you successfully harvested an animal? Uh, three months ago. <laughs> All I, right. I, I killed a cow's ago. buck down in Arizona with my traditional longbow. Yeah. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. You're not a man, Mark. Yeah, I'm not, we're not. Well, we're not. I've, just, I've just started hunting. I'm, I've, oh, I'm, I'm wonderful! My, uh, you got all this year. stuff ahead of you. Yeah, yes, that's I'm right. Started, you don't have so. much gray in your beard. That's the <laughs> no. Oh, no, beautiful no, thing. No, no, you're great. You just inspired you know, me to keep going. For, <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. that's so, amazing. So, um, llamas help you get back there. Yeah. I mean, I mean, there for me, particularly elk hunting. You know, it's a pretty big load when you get one. Yeah. So I can go out with three llamas. I always throw an empty pack frame on top of one llama going in. So I basically have four pack animals, count myself. Mm-hmm. So I can take the camp and a boned-out elk and get myself and everything out in one load. Wow. And, that, and that's a perfect combination. They all fit yeah. in a two-horse trailer, and you're and, in and out. Yeah. And how, um, how, how easy is it to, to maintain mon- uh, llamas? In, They're absolutely you know? trouble-free. Really? I've had really? horse people in amazement because a little carry. You can stake them out as long as you get ta- don't get tangled up. They can go two or three days without water if they're eating green grass. They eat anything. They eat willows, alder, knapweed. We I hunted with anything. pack goats. Really? I hunted with pack, pack goats, goats for a long great time. Too. They, they're they wonderful. Were, they were great. I mean, they followed me around like, like my dogs do. Yep. And then I'd be like, hop in the truck. And they just hopped in the back of the truck. And I just shut the tailgate. And they were under my canopy. And I've we heard just, nothing but good things about goats. The, the only problem I had with goats was they weren't that strong. And so... Yeah. They were great. You had, to get an elk out, you kind of you had to have some strong fit goats. Yeah. yeah. Or you had to, and you kind of had to have like six of them, yeah. seven of them. It gets yeah. to be a big posse. Yeah, a big pod. How much? And, how much can a llama carry? Out? You know, I put I put too much <laughs> weight on them at times. Uh, but you know, a good strong llama in good shape on a trail, a hundred pounds. Okay. And you go down from that. Yeah. Based on the terrain, whether you're going uphill, what kind of shape they're in, what the size of the llama is, so anywhere from fifty to a hundred, you know. <laughs> but okay. and, and and there is a training. It's much like goats. You have to you have to take them out ahead of the season and get them give them exercise. Fit. You take you know you take them out and just hike day hikes for a few miles, and you start loading them up with sandbags, and you take mm-hmm. them and work them, and okay. so, you, so you can go. Because the worst thing to do is be out on a great hunt. Ready to go, and the llama lays down the trail and says, "I've had enough." <laughs> right, and right. so you have you have to invest some time into getting yeah. ready. But the reward is they're trouble free. Um, so when you're feeding them throughout the year and take care of them throughout the year, they're a pretty easy keeper. They're very easy because you know, we I've had mules and horses. Yeah, horses were were a little tough. Mules were pretty easy to keep. Yeah. They they were they were not bad for me, but they were, um, and they are strong. Yep. And I could I could have one mule and go in, yep. but um, it again. But though it's just it takes time to take care of an animal. Yeah, it does. You know, and and I think horses, and mules are more pr- prone to injuries and vet bills and chewing yeah. and all that sort of stuff and yeah. floating their teeth and all that sort of Especially thing. Especially with horses, and you don't have yeah. that with llamas. No, they're oh. not. You trim their toes with a like a pruning shears kind of thing. You yeah, know? Okay. goats and, goats were a little bit of work because I had to trim their hooves a lot. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, goats. Yeah. But yep. the problem. That's because we we live in like basically Portland, Oregon, which is like a mud hole, real flat, and no there's rocks no rocks, or, and yeah, so yeah, and yeah. their hooves would get easily get hoof rot and stuff. Oh, and yeah. You didn't keep them down all the time, yep. and yep. here it would be. I always said, you know, if I move further east in a drier climate, I'd love to have some animals because yep. they're just a lot easier to keep when the ground is hard and dry. That's and, true, and of course, llamas came from South America, where it's really steep and rocky, and yep, that's what that was. Know. Another question I had. Are llamas real agile? When they you, say can you go up the back? rule of thumb is they'll go anywhere you can go without using your hands. Okay. And I've literally had, That's I went in on a goat hunt. This is a scary little story. But I went in on a goat hunt, and I walked across this knife ridge. And I thought, oh, my. Oh, man. I hope it doesn't snow while I'm back here. Because it's like several hundred feet vertical <laughs> this way and several hundred feet vertical that way. I went across there. In the middle of the night, I woke up because a tent collapsed because of heavy snow. Oh, my. And I'm out and go hunting. I'm on myself. Nobody knows where I'm at. Nobody knows. I'm in the, <laughs> down near Yellowstone, just north of Yellowstone Park. And I, I, I said, oh, i got to get out of here. So I, 
<laughs> put the llamas together, you tie them all up. You, like a string of horses, you mm-hmm. tie them together. But I took, like, my spotting scope, everything that I cared about and put in my day pack. <laughs> and I held on to that rope. I usually have it doubled around my hand. I didn't have it doubled around my hand. Uh-huh. And I felt a sharp pull. I was letting go. <laughs> Those babies are going over the cliff. I wasn't. And I, I thought the worst thing to do is stop in the middle. Don't get hesitant. Just walk. Just keep going. And I walked across that ledge. It was maybe only 50 feet across, you know. Uh, but the yeah, well, the it doesn't take feet. only so 50, 50 feet when you're walking you, on snow on a knife the, edge. Uh, you got to the top, and it was kind of like, like this, a four miles to the, me. There was a, a pitch that was about as high as this wall here to the ceiling. You know, it was eight, wow. ten feet tall, and it was just this broken, you know, big giant boulders and stuff. I said, Don't stop for that. Just keep walking. Just keep. I climbed up the top of that thing with those on, and they went up through, and I just my my adrenaline. <laughs> I mean, I was just so. I went home, and I never hunted anymore that year. I said, you know, this is too close to death. I got a lot of lo- <laughs> things I love. Right. You know, I've killed a few goats with my bow. I don't need this goat that bad. Yeah. Right? So that was the end of the season for me. But it was, uh, it was a memorable moment, that's for sure. I was um, hunting elk this last year, and um, we've been in some Hell's Canyon areas where it's mm-hmm. real steep. And we had some horses, um, and I can remember walking this cliff edge and just and, – and uh, I I just got off. I'm like, I cannot ride this horse. And there were some cowboys with us that are, you know, out there raising cattle and stuff. And they they live in the saddle. They just, they're just riding those horses right on this, this cliff. Trust the horse totally. You just, right? They're like, and I'm like, I, no, I, I don't care. I don't know if I, if <laughs> I rode it my whole life that I would do that. I yeah, mean, it's I, just, I hopped off and I'm like, and I started leading the horse. And it was funny because as we were approaching the cliff, they were brothers, and the younger brother was like, dude, why are we going this way? And he just complained the whole time. And the older brother was like, you know, man up, you know, get tough. And, and the, uh, the, the, the younger one, I was like, he, I could tell he wanted to get off his horse. But if his older brother wasn't getting off, he wasn't getting <laughs> he off. Keep the macho image. <laughs> That's up right. There, so right? they both yeah. wrote. I'm like, yeah, I don't have that problem, man. I, <laughs> my survival instinct's stronger than my ego. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's so many experiences. You know, it's all about the experiences. Yeah. You know, the animal harvested to me. I mean, they they come and they go. You know. Yeah. But the experiences to get there. You know. Yes. I mean, I was in Russia watching Dick Robertson who makes long, uh, recurves and longbows for a living, and I watched him shoot his first big brown bear in russia in really 92 and just to and be out there with these russians don't speak a word of english and you don't speak a word of russian and spend days with them i mean what a hoot, you know? <laughs> what, a hoot eh? what a hoot for some people some people would find that a horrible experience oh it's just wonderful yeah, but i i think that's the difference you know there's a lot of uh hunters out there that that really that that's why they're out there that's why for that adventure there. Yeah, it is. It's pushing the limit a little bit, you know. Just not not the, in a way that's foolish or. So so, um, right. you're uh, in your seventies. Um, you solo hunt. Yeah, I do a lot of solo hunting. And um, uh, I heard that you went on a recent solo hunt not too long ago by yourself and, and shot a ram with your stick bow. I did get a good ram, and of course that's everybody's dream. That's. I wrote a story for Traditional Bowhunter Magazine. It's called 50-Year Ram Quest because I hunted my first bighorn ram in the bighorn crags in Idaho when I was 18 years old. You could just buy a tag over the counter. As long as it's a three-quarter curl, you could just go hunting any, any oh, year. Oh, wow. Well, we got snowed out with a foot of snow, and it was we were there. I was with 17 pounds. I was 17 pounds for 10 days. That's why I took my total pack. We weighed 17 pounds. I wasn't prepared for snow. So, and anyway, then I... I uh, I had a, a permit in Colorado. I missed the biggest ram in the unit. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I ended up in 1981, I had a tag in the middle fork of the salmon. And I hunted 20 days, 22 days, and ended up shooting one with a rifle. So I didn't count, wow. that, as a, didn't count that as a kill for me. It was mm-hmm. just uh, get my tag punched. So when I finally drew this ram in Montana, it was an opportunity. There were some big rams. This was a, an exceptionally nice old ram. And wow. I put the stock on him, uh, made a good shot. It was like perfect, you know. It was, on, it was hung up on a cliff, and uh, you know the guy that had hunted there previous, another traditional boner, said, "Take some rope, you know, and some some repelling gear because you might have to need it, you know, get down." And so I, anyway, so I I looked at this rope and I threw it over the side, but 
and it wasn't long enough <laughs> to get down to the sheets. I thought, this is not good. How am I going to do that? So I went up a, a ledge, and uh, a crack in a, you know, kind of, it was kind of a crack, just like a little fault crack. But there was enough I could lean up against the rock and get up to the sheep. And, but the only thing I had to muscle, the only thing I had to stabilize myself while I tried to muscle this thing, it wrapped around this bush, this shrub. And I had to use the shrub as my support <laughs> while I got the sheep off the shrub. And so, I, you know, I thought, you know, this could be bad. But <laughs> <laughs> this could be bad. <laughs> but the sheep went off, and I was still hanging on the bush. So we got that off and wow. packed it out in the dark. And uh, yeah, Who's was, we? Me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. what I thought. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Wow. Uh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's that really good. neat. And then I, I only had two days. I had to run that sheep to a uh, biologist in Thompson Falls because I had to have it measured and punched and everything because yeah. I was leaving to go to Kansas on a deer hunt in the next day. So I had to go. or I had one day in between, and I went to Kansas and hunted whitetails in Kansas. So, yeah. Wow. The guys, yeah. So is is traditional bow hunting your, your favorite hunting? or? Yeah. I, I went. I started... Uh, so I started bow hunting when I was eight years old. When compounds came out, somebody tried to explain what a compound was over the phone. I'd never seen a picture of one or anything. <laughs> he tried to dis- explain they had wheels on the ends and they had these yeah. cables that crossed. <laughs> I couldn't get a picture. I couldn't. I mean, it wouldn't formulate. All I'd seen is, is long bows and recurves. Mm-hmm. So he said, "Let's." He wanted to go see one. So we drove to Twin Falls, Idaho, and a guy who was a dealer and had uh, one, and we pulled it back and it had thirty five percent let off, and we. And we each pulled back and said, our problems are over. <laughs> yeah. We each ordered one, and we went on a killing spree for about 10 years. <laughs> killing spree. <laughs> and, oh. and, you know, and then about early 80s, I decided, you know, I could see where Archie was going, you know, technologically. Yeah. And it just wasn't for me. I'm, yeah. I'm not against it necessarily, but, but it, it wasn't for me. Yeah. And I decided to go back to a recurve. And then I went doll sheep hunting with that recurve. And everything was a <laughs> compound shot. <laughs> oh. and these big rams standing broadside, a little bit too far out of range. Yeah. Why well, didn't bring the compound? But I ended, up, <laughs> I ended up killing a really nice doll ram that year. And so then that was a tradition. So I didn't hunt since 1980, what was that, 1983. From 1983 till ni- 2010, I only bow hunted. I didn't shoot only recurves and long bows. That was it. And then I ran out of meat one year and I shot a cow elk with my gun. And so, and I've done that once or twice before since then. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's a letdown for me when I switch the rifle. It's kind of in terms of meat source rather than a hunt for me, but that's just me. You know, I mean, I getting close is where it's at for me and yeah, being out there. Yeah. So well, I think that's what for me, cause I've just gone out with him and the first time I went out with a camera and then we got so close to the animal. I think that was, it's what's really got me hooked on it. Is you get so close to them. That's I, I like to characterize it. Animals have evolved for tens of thousands of years to have a defense system that works for them, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the ones that don't have it working die. Right. They get eaten. So I like to feel myself penetrating that defense system, the natural defense system of the animal. I feel like that's an accomplishment. Yeah. I totally respect those animals, their capability. And when you can penetrate that, you sort of picture yourself as a lion. Can I get within lion pouncing distance of this animal before I, I pull my bow back? You know, that is, yeah. that's yeah. hunting to me. I mean, that's, oh, yeah. that's yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's called and fair chase. On, 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 on a cliff edge by <laughs> yourself, yeah. cliff edge, that's yeah. just a whole nother <laughs> realm. It's another uh, level. Just yep. getting yeah, to the location yep. is a feat in itself right. in, in many it of these places. It is. It's just, And so then to also harvest one and bring it home i mean yeah. that's that's it's all public lands you know so it's the beautiful thing is we've been gifted this stuff from teddy roosevelt and i get really emotional about it because it's it allows people of ordinary means to do anybody can do this and you know, i don't spend any money doing this stuff i mean it's just you draw a sheep tag in montana you can be you know living subsistence living and still do it or you can have a lot of money and still do it it's all yeah. you know it's 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 available for everybody as opposed to, you know, private land hunts have often become 
who can afford to pay the bill. Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. I mean, eventually so, that's where it goes. Yeah. So and, this is such a treasure, you know. Um, and you've been involved with BHA for how long? Oh, six or seven years. I, I was the first chairman for the Montana chapter. So I did that for a number of years. We're, I was doing everything. You know? <laughs> and I finally found this, uh, somebody who would, who would be my co-chair. So I did that for a few years. And, and uh, my heart and soul is conservation. Yeah, you know, it isn't necessarily fundraising or events. That isn't. This just isn't necessarily where my heart right. goes. So I step back and I do like do with the conservation stuff of Montana chapter, mm-hmm. and we have two competent co-chairs that take care of a lot of the other stuff, and they're doing yeah, great. Yeah. And I'm excited, and we've got a good board scattered around the state. You know, the state's seven hundred miles across, so we've tried to geographically scatter our representation so they can kind of be watchdogs and spokesmen for BHA. You know, in different yeah. parts of the state, you know. They know best what the solutions are and the people. And What has been the most rewarding part of, of being involved in BHA? You know, it's, for me, it's, it's getting people involved. I mean, this, there's, this organization's alive today at this rendezvous. I mean, it's yeah. people who care. And I, I love peer, people that don't have gray in their beards and know that they're here. Because <laughs> that is the future, you know. And I right. think for, just be able to pass this on, you know, the next generation is the accomplishment, what you can do along the way to keep the same opportunities. Right now we're working on trying to keep motorized uh, watercraft use where it's at now instead of creeping further and further up drainage. That's our newest project we're just unveiling right now. And and uh, it's to, there's so much new technology coming over the hill in all these fields. We just need some places for quiet water recreation. So that's our current project. But we I just met with the governor's resource assistant on uh, three days ago on protecting sage grouse habitat in Montana, where it yeah. exists, because it isn't just sage grouse we're protecting; we're, we're protecting Trickles. all that sage prairie yeah. uh, ecosystem, which is you know antelope and mule deer and sharp-tailed grouse and all that sort of stuff. You know, it's all yeah. uses that same habitat. So keeping big blocks of that habitat have big payoffs. In fact, you know, I just I'm just penning an op-ed here in the, one of the meetings, well, slow is about the value of protecting sage grouse to Montana is economically because it, it's the way alive people come to Montana and they live and they're willing to give up even some income to live in a place where they right. got public lands and stuff right. to do all this stuff. And if you lose that, why would people want to come to Montana? But there's heart surgeons that choose to live in Montana because because they can go outside and enjoy these public lands, you know. But they I wouldn't think, be here without. I think a lot of these people, a lot of the, the threat to the public land is is that, <clears throat> you know, most people are not, willing to give up public land they think that handing it over to a state isn't giving it up they think that that would just make it managed better yeah. like i don't think anyone most hunters especially are are for in favor you know most people in the united states yeah. i don't think they're in favor of handing over public lands and not having them anymore they're just, that's not but that's not the story they're being told right the reality is I mean, I know a lot of state lands. I was a district ranger for 300,000 acres out here. And I had to intermingle with state people all the time. They have a different mandate. Their mandate is to make money yes. for the school system. You know, right. So they, they graze it heavier. They log it heavier. And I'm not necessarily against either of those things. But they're pumping the edge. They, their job isn't to manage for wildlife. They're managing for income for the school system, which is yes. fine. But you can't expect them to be managing for fisheries habitat and wildlife habitat and all that, optimizing all that stuff. And it's very expensive to manage. You know, we're, we're lucky, you know, Congress appropriates right. some money to manage this land. Well, the state's not going to have that kind of money. So we, they're going to get, in the long run, they're going to see this stuff's costing us net income. We can't graze heavy enough or log heavy enough well, uh, to you, make it pay for it. So we've got to sell it. Montana got to sell it. Sell it and lose yeah, it. And, right? and then mean, there's some rich guy. It isn't the guy down the street's going to get it. They're going to be outbid by people who have billions. Right. right. Yeah. yeah, and the average yeah. person yeah. then can't go out and, and no, you're, do what you're you, you locked out. And then what are you going to do? Why would you live in Montana? You right. know, move yeah. to California where the weather's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like it, like uh, yeah, no, it's absolutely true. And so I think um, <clears throat> understanding the process. The other thing I hear a lot of is that the process is um, that that it's being abused by the state and that uh, or by the federal government, and that if states had more control, it would go away. And um, and you know, I talk, I've talked to Ty Stubblefield a lot on the podcast, and 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 we talked about this, saying you know the process isn't necessarily uh, 
broken as much as there's no participation from hunters. Hunters need to speak up to protect what they got. I mean, if they don't, they're, you know, agencies, I was in a decision-making position, pretty important position for a long time. If I don't have people pushing me in the right direction, it's hard to go there because yeah. everybody else is pushing me somewhere else. It's, hard, it's important for people to stand up on all these issues. And, of course, at BHA, one of the jobs we can do is educate people how and when and, you know, right. to get involved and how to be effective. And, and there is effectiveness, you know. There's an opportune time to be involved, and, and then there's too late to get involved, you know, okay. and, and, or a different way. or You know, so it is, it is. But, you know, the wonderful thing about National Environmental Policy Act, you can badmouth it if you want, but it gives every chance, every person a chance to participate. Public participation is probably one of the strongest parts of that act. It yeah. mandates public participation. So if, but if you don't show up, you can't blame the government for going a different direction. If you don't even, I mean, it's hard to yeah. complain if you didn't that's participate, where, you know? Yeah, right. that's where, you, you know, yep. get involved like this and, and becoming a member of BHA and, and others, you know, you can start to participate in your local chapters too and all of that. And we're love, you know. We, it's one thing to be a donut eater on the board. It's another thing to <laughs> grab it and grab an issue and run with it, you yeah. know. In fact, today I just had a guy come up and he said, geez, we've got this, one of my favorite spots. He's a board member. And I, and he, and, uh, but it's been taken over by ATVs and off road, you know, off road vehicles and stuff, motorcycles and everything. And he says, well, he just closed it, but they keep doing it. I said, well, how about making it a work project? How about making it a chapter work project? We got 500 members in this state and galvanize over near Helen and get that project knocked out. We can rent a little piece of equipment to do some of the heavy work. We can do a lot of the handwork and get it knocked out. It's a great idea. So we're going to, that's going to be our new. This spring's yeah. uh, work project. Oh yeah, and, and you know. all of those local areas, you can you can go, you can get those sort of communities yep. going, and it's it's more than just dollars. That and Habitat Watchmen, that's a program that BHA has is is engaging people to be a watchman for their area, whether it's your favorite drainage or your favorite national forest or whatever. Mm-hmm. You can be the watchdog. You get to know the decision makers. You watch what's going on. What issues are they are they proposing to develop? With some big part that you don't think should be developed you yeah know, you bring then you're you're the eyes and ears and bring that to bha's attention we can get engaged you know but so yeah. that habitat watchman program is uh is an important part of the project gets all types of members can get engaged in that so yep well greg i want to thank you for coming on the podcast today yeah you bet uh it's it it great to meet you man <laughs> it's always really fun to is. tell stories <laughs> wow. I, I, there's uh uh, we we, we got to do this again sometime. Yeah, okay, great. I mean, you can't reach the finish line too soon because, no, you know. I, I got a lot of things planned. <laughs> I got uh, you know, New Zealand hunt next year. Oh, wow. Alaska fishing, a good float trip this summer. What's the key to l- longevity here? Like, you know, you're out there, you're active, you're fit. What's the key, man? Always be looking ahead. <laughs> yeah, have stop. several trips don't, planned ahead. Like the knife edge. Don't look back. Don't <laughs> yeah, stop. Keep going. Keep moving. That's, right. that's exactly it. So, don't watch yeah. the hunting on TV. Go out and do the hunting. <laughs> yeah, right? You're right. Exactly. You brilliant. Know. That is Where brilliant. So, yeah. All right. Thank you so okay. much. Thanks, Greg. Hey, Appreciate thanks, it. Okay, Gritty friends. I hope you enjoyed that podcast. If you did, please take a moment to leave us a review on iTunes, Podbean, or Stitcher. We love reading your reviews. And connect with us on social media if you're on there. Look us up on Facebook and Instagram. And take a moment to subscribe to our YouTube channel so you can receive notifications when we upload new videos. We've got a sweet deal with Mountain Ops. You get 20% off on all Mountain Ops supplements, combo packs, and apparel when you type in the word gritty at checkout. If you're a hardcore elk hunter or you want to be, go to the Elk 101 website online and check them out. Our friend Corey Jacobson is killing it with some of the best elk hunting information and entertainment on the web. If you haven't heard, we're doing a huge gear giveaway to try and grow and expand the Gritty community on Facebook and Instagram. I asked a bunch of friends to pitch in on this gear giveaway and they all came through with some awesome stuff. Our friends at Kefaru, Rockside, First Light, Phelps Game Calls, One Shot Gear, Mountain Ops, Triple X Archery, Blacktail Outdoors, and Is It September Yet are pitching in some sweet gear for the giveaway. We'll announce all the details in the next few weeks. All you have to do to be entered to win is like our Gritty Bowman Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. All right, friends, let me leave you with one other quote from Theodore Roosevelt who said, It behooves every man to remember that the work of the critic is of altogether secondary importance and that 
In the end, progress is accomplished by the man who does things. We all have a choice. We can be people who do things or people who criticize the work of others. It's pretty simple, really. Get out there and do your thing. Good luck on your hunts and stay gritty. <laughs> This is Ty Stubblefield, and you're listening to the Gritty Bowman. Gritty Bowman. <laughs>